Hello and welcome to this screencast on Building Global Empires, an overview of Chapter 32 in Bentley and Ziegler's Traditions and Encounters, 5th edition. This chapter is simultaneously the most important chapter, I think, in this time period and the one that I am most disappointed with in all of Traditions and Encounters, unfortunately. Let me explain both things. I think that it is the most important in this section because it is the chapter that ties together parts of the world the most. And you'll, you'll, you'll find connections to all of the different chapters um, from 1750 to 1900. So that's going to be 28, 29, 30, 31, and then chapter 32 here. And there's a lot of good information. I'm not disappointed in the quality of the factual information that's in here. I just need to be honest because it's going to come out through the screencast that there are a couple of things that I think are regrettable, and that's the use of images that are really from what um, theorists will call the colonial gaze, the way um, colonial officials looked at colonized peoples. That's what we see instead of, say, as much of the reverse as I would like. And then secondly, the way it mixes causes and effects in a way that's less complex than we'd hope. But do know that there are there is important information in here, and um, we can use that information to construct our own more humane narratives. So let's take a look. One way to do that is by foregrounding resistance in how we look at these stories. So I have three maps here that we'll, we'll click through, and you can, of course, pause and look at them more closely. But it's important to know that people resisted colonialism at every step. And that a lot of what we see as colonialism, like say British India, is in fact, a was in itself a response to resistance by people in India, like the Great Rebellion of 1857 or the first Anglo-Afghan War. So bear that in mind. We can see that here with the areas that were most affected by the rebellion, which was about a lot more than just um, rumors about cartridges. I mean, that's in here, but it's really, it's about a lot more than that, this rebellion. Then if we move forward, we can see rebellious activity in Africa, resistance to imperialism. So it's all over the place. So a lot of what we see as colonialism is really a response to resistance to colonialism. So it's just important to keep that in mind as you take a look at things. That some of the things that are listed as causes in the in the chapter are actually decades after acts of resistance, which is the kind of thing that gets put at the end. So, you know, like let's just take the example of if we go back one slide here because I'm all up in my feelings about this. Whoa, we got some stuff. Okay, there we go. If we take a look at this, this rebellion in 1857, 1858, Rudyard Kipling, the guy who wrote White Man's Burden, he was not yet born. Kipling, in fact, is only a few years older than Gandhi, who was a leader of Indian independence. So these things are all mixed together. So as you're looking at it, maybe put the chronology back together in your head and be like, oh, wait a minute, some of these causes are actually effects and vice versa. All right, let's do it. Here's the key points. The first key concept, I think you can see the word economy, the first key concept in this um, period is about industrialization. And so this is about industrialization. And you can see the subtopic there. Again, this is not, this is a cause of imperialism. Sure, imperialist countries are seeking resources and they're seeking markets both to sell goods and markets for capital, places to invest. But it's also true that these goods that are coming and these are capital, it's not capital, these are raw materials really, that are coming from the colonized world are also essential to a lot of aspects of industrialization. So in this way, imperialism is a contributing factor to industrialization. If we just think of the first commodity here on this list of rubber, without a ready supply of rubber, a lot of the second industrial revolution that used rubber belts in things like engines and more complex factory machinery would not have been possible. Or we can think about electricity as a key feature in the second industrial revolution, which required copper, like a lot of copper. 
the point being that one of the things that makes the second industrial revolution different from the first industrial revolution is the use of foreign sourced raw materials. Even the quintessential first industrial revolution product, textiles, is increasingly being made, is um, for Britain is always being made with foreign cotton, but cotton becomes this huge global market by the middle of the 1800s. And it's coming from, from British colonial areas in India and Egypt, in addition to the American South. The point being, again, that we have cause and effect here, but it is important to keep all of this in mind. When you look at a railroad like this too, this picture's from the book. So you might think, oh, here's some industrial technology being brought to Britain. I kind of wonder if these Indian, uh, looks like they're men sitting on the ground watching this go by are like, hey, there's people in there. It looks like they're no longer just taking our stuff away in these trains because these trains that come in are also like big straws to suck resources out of the interior of these countries. And they also provide infrastructure that allows people to connect and eventually leads to resistance against the British in India. So it's complicated. But keep those complexities in mind. All right. So what is imperialism? I've been talking a little bit like you know what it is and in part because a lot of students come into high school world history with a, an understanding of the term but we should have an idea. And this image shows the imperial mindset. This is from a British magazine. Excuse me, it's from a German magazine. This is the Berlin conference that was held in Germany in 1884. And you can see you have a group of Europeans. There's one guy from the Ottoman Empire who might be European, of course, too. But there's um, one non-Christian European in the back. Now, um, but we do have all these Europeans and they're dividing up Africa. So that is imperialism. So remember, imperialism is empire building. These are all examples of imperialism from the time period. But you can see different kinds of ways. Okay. Well, I should say French colonialism. My bad. Another way that this is related to industrial revolution is second industrial revolution technologies make greater degrees of imperial imperialism pop possible than ever before. So things like telegraphs and breech loading rifles and machine guns and railroads and steamships all provided a means of control. So this would be a way where industrialization is, if not a cause, an essential part of the context for some countries becoming imperialist powers. Okay. Similarly, or maybe the flip side of that, is that there's also something called economic imperialism, which Bentley and Ziegler don't really devote a full subtopic to, but you should be aware of because it's part of the AP curriculum and also because it's important. Sometimes this is also called neocolonialism, but what this refers to is when imperialist countries or companies, so powerful entities from outside of a country are profiting from resources, whether they're human or material, inside of a country. What makes economic imperialism different than just regular imperialism is that the country that's being exploited remains independent, largely. So in the bottom left here is the port of Buenos Aires, Buenos Aires, Argentina. And the rehabilitation of that port was all funded by or mainly funded by British capital, British investors. And then they profited from it. And those profits came from resources coming from the interior of Argentina, especially beef that created a profitable export trade. And those profits then were being reaped by people from outside the country. You can see something similar with the Suez Canal, with the way American fruit companies, with support of the United States government, profited from the lands and labor, people in Central America and the Caribbean. So we call that economic imperialism. Move myself again. These are three important terms that come up that are useful to use. The first one, metropole, is a very useful term. And the metropole refers to the imperialist country. So it's like the metropolitan, like the, like the center, if you will, the metropolis. So in British Indian relations during this time where Britain is the imperialist country, Britain is the metropole. Now, this term is kind of useful because then you can use it to talk about some of these things in general. 
So you could say people from metropoles, and that could be French in Indochina, Southeast Asia. That could be the Dutch in what's today Indonesia. It could be Americans in the Philippines. But so from the metropole means the imperialist country. So metropole here would be the opposite of colony. Okay, settler colonialism is important. I mean, if especially you know we're living here in a settler. Or I'm broadcasting from a settler colony on occupied Dakota land. So settler colonialism is about when people move to the country that they're colonizing. So where there's settlers involved, it's exactly what it sounds like. The thing that makes it different is settlers often seek to displace the native people. They're not just going to exploit the resources, like say by diamond mining or um, rubber plantations or trading for palm oil. They're going to they're gonna come in, they're going to move and seek to dislocate the people who are already there. So you want to look for where that happens, where it happens a little, where it happens a lot. Okay. Then nationalism is complex here. Nationalism can be imperialist. So like German nationalists often supported imperialist policies for Germany because they thought Germany was great because it was filled with Germans and therefore they should take over other parts of the world. But nationalism could also fuel anti-imperialism. So in places like India, when people began to develop, or some people developed a consciousness as Indians, meaning from, which is not as obvious as it sounds, because people also had religious and caste and ethnic and professional and you know gender identities, when that Indian identity starts to form and become more important, that kind of nationalism is going to lead to resistance to imperialism. So it can do both things. So just keep in mind the complexities of nationalism, please. All right. Sometimes it's hard to move this guy, like harder than you'd think. All right, so industrializing states expanded their overseas colonies. So that's a couple of examples here. British India is probably the most important example. Remember, more people live in India today than live in the Western Hemisphere, and British India also included Pakistan and Bangladesh, which are very large countries in population. Okay, so you want to keep your eyes on that. And then also the expansion into the Pacific Islands. So there's a, expanding their existing overseas colonies means taking existing things like the British East India Company and then expanding it into a full-on colonial venture. Or in the Pacific where you had like whaling and coaling and missionary outposts all of a sudden turning into again full-on colonies so things that already existed becoming more intense so look out for that um the dutch east indies are another example of that imperialism also is going to be like new kinds of colonies and the book will do a little bit to help you with this idea of what's so new about this like imperialism has always been happening there's been empires the whole time basically in world history or most of the time well, there's some new forms out there happening. And again, capitalism empowers some business directors and financiers like this guy, Cecil Roach, here so much that you get colonies that are essentially individuals, if you will, with so much power. So here, um, the British South Africa Company, the investments in mining especially, is able to gain concessions, sign treaties with indigenous leaders in Southern Africa, and pretty much rule what look like colonies, but as like company territories. So, it's, so that's new, right? It's a little bit like what the East India companies have been doing, but it's more direct and um, more focused, I think. Okay. So you want to kind of keep a lookout for the different ways that imperialism works. And these would be kinds of political imperialism. Okay. Now there'll be conflicts over these things, as we see. So this image shows conflict then between China and Japan. So as Japan became an imperialist country, it came into conflict with other empires, the Russian and Chinese empires in their neighboring areas. So you can see um, diplomacy means negotiations between countries like international politics. So that's going to involve the treaties that ended all these wars, these three wars. And it's also going to involve the straight negotiations that avoided war. So one of the reasons the Berlin Conference happened was to keep European countries from fighting each other over places that they were 
claiming in Africa to kind of adjudicate between themselves. Now, get this just shows like how colonialism is colonialism, though colonized people in Africa had no say in this, nor was there always a super great grasp on reality from the colonizers themselves. The Germans wind up claiming some territory, that little piece of Namibia in Southwest Africa that sticks out like a panhandle. The Germans negotiated for that because they wanted access to the Zambezi River, which they could use to go into the Indian Ocean and then travel to their other colony. Spoiler, uh, the Zambezi River is also home to Victoria Falls, which is one of the largest waterfalls in the world. You cannot take a boat from Namibia to the Indian Ocean. Sorry. So, you know, even though they didn't have perfect information, they're still competing with each other. And diplomacy was one way that that was resolved. I think it's funny how the key concepts say the United States also participated in this process. It's kind of a little bit of the uh, political correctness where there's some places where you can't criticize the United States too much in um, history classes. So or a little more sensitive language. Um, and it's really not so it's just, it's just factual. This happened. The United States did become an imperialist country. And so you can kind of look through those, the you know, second and third things are territorial acquisitions. And then the bottom one there would be economic imperialism. That's a little uh, Spanish-American war there in the top right. As um, I've alluded to here, we have this. Now, the the new, um, the way it's phrased in the new course and exam description for AP World, this is classified as a rationale for imperialism. And I think that language is really good. I think it's unfortunate when these things come at the beginning of the discussion of imperialism as if they're a cause, because really these kinds of ideas developed alongside of imperialism, meaning that British imperialism was used as evidence to support social Darwinism as applied to international relations. What am I saying? It's not so it's not so much that British political elites decided that they were some sort of master race, so they should go out and take over other parts of the world. It's more that people looked at the fact that the British had taken over other parts of the world and then argued that the British were some kind of master race. See what I'm saying? It's like with slavery and race and racism, it's a little reversed from how it usually gets put out there. So again, to take the example of a white, the white man's burden, which is a poem reproduced in the first section of this chapter, that's written in 1898, and or 99 even, something like that. So it's at the, literally the it's literally at the very end of the time period we're looking at here, um, and so Kipling's racism towards colonized people is shaped by his own personal experiences growing up in British India, but also. You know, his young adulthood reading the news and seeing the domination of places in Africa and Asia by Europeans during this immediate time period. So, but really the word that's not on this slide that you should know is social Darwinism. So scientific ideas are used to justify colonialism. Okay. And then here, um, this was mentioned above, but here's a picture with sheep. So settlers often bring their animals that are part of the colonization process. So Anglo settlers in the East Coast of the United States um, brought pigs, which destroyed a lot of the um, gardens and farming areas of indigenous people. And here we see the same kind of thing happening with sheep. Um, other invasive species like rabbits just alter the environment. There's still millions of sheep in Australia. You might Google that and see how many sheep there are. We're talking about a lot. So these are all places where that happens. The middle thing is interesting, the middle bullet here, because there's nowhere in Africa that becomes like Australia or like the United States or Canada, where there's a majority of European descended English speaking people that are running the country. But there are powerful minorities of white English speakers, or in the case of Algeria, French speakers, or in Namibia, German speakers, um, who then make decolonization more difficult because they live there. They're not going anywhere. Okay. Then the last example we can also think of um, 
Russia as a country that's expanding, but just in, in that land empire format. Russians actually gain a lot of extra territory in the 1800s. And then finally, we have this, which is how we get the form. Oh, no, there's one more slide after this. Um, how we get the formation of new national identity. So here, this is what I was mentioning before. We get the Indian National Congress. And so people starting to think of themselves as Indian is created by British imperialism. So what do they have in common? We're all, they're all part of the British colony of India. That's what connects them as a people. They have a shared interest in seeking better treatment in that situation. So that brings them together. Okay. The, um, the course and exam description also uses a couple other examples that might be familiar from other places, including from US history. Um, there's other examples of that. What maybe we learn about in the United States as Indian nations from the past that are actually, you know, uh, confederations or political entities that came into being just to resist colonization. They didn't exist forever. Um, like the Seminoles, be an example of that, or Creek, um, Lakota. There's there's a, a lot of possible ways that this this comes down. The same thing will be true in places in Africa where there's new political identities that are put together to resist imperialism. All right. The, the fourth key concept in this chapter, or excuse me, in this time period that's also in the chapter, has to do with global migration. And that's a, connected to imperialism in the sense that some of the people, like um, indentured workers from British India, are moving inside of, exist, uh, inside of these new global empires. So if you look at the green on this map here, You'll see workers from India going to British colonies in the Indian Ocean, like Mauritius, or Mauritius, or in Africa, like what's today Kenya in East Africa or South Africa, into the Caribbean in colonies like Trinidad, which is um, I'm going to do this here. Trinidad's right here. Here we go, or Jamaica. So those things, places, were all inside the British Empire. You should know, though, that a lot of this is happening outside of these new empires. So in a sense, this is an additional topic that's in chapter 32 because it's the chapter that's bringing everything together. And that's why we get this wild world map with, um, you know, it's different view and people going all over the place. So some of this is familiar, like wage workers, people moving from places like Europe to um, the United States or the Americas looking for jobs. That's a pretty familiar story, you know, from whatever U.S. history many of you have had before or, or Canadian history. Um, but then you also, we should include settlers in this. People are going to take land that's been taken from others. And then we should consider that during this time, like with colonialism, and in fact, probably conditioned by colonialism, get racist laws that are in place. And the first immigration regulations are about race, excluding Chinese workers, say, from the United States. And also a similar thing happens in Australia. That will be a product of a lot of the things that are happening during this time. Okay. So consider as you go through here two things, how the world was very connected throughout the 1800s and perhaps different ways that we can frame the narrative of imperialism in order to have a more humane understanding of the world today and in the past. All right, thank you.